Welcome back to Banging the Can, the Houston sports podcast that does not apologize for championship rings and things. I am your host, Ross Bolin, and today we are joined by filmmaker, documentarian, writer, producer, and director Bradley Jackson to discuss his latest project, Facing Nolan, a documentary about legendary baseball player Nolan Ryan, the Hall of Fame pitcher, the man, the myth, the legend. This is the definitive Nolan Ryan documentary, the only one of its kind. And I was fortunate enough to catch its world premiere earlier this year at South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas. It has since been acquired and will screen nationwide in theaters one night only later this month on May 24th, 2022. And I cannot more highly recommend it, not only for Astros fans, but baseball fans in general, and really just anyone who is a fan of a great story. So let's get into our interview with the documentary's creator. But first, today's episode of Banging the Can, featuring Bradley Jackson, is brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN is here to drastically enhance your web browsing experience and data security. No one likes to be watched or tracked, even if they have nothing to hide. That's why it's important to step up your privacy game whenever possible. If you aren't using a VPN right now, you're currently open to having your internet data creeped on in a big way. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and is a service that protects your internet connection and privacy online. It creates an encrypted tunnel for your data, protects your online identity by hiding your IP address. It allows you to use public Wi-Fi hotspots safely and much more. VPNs are the only way to be sure that your real location and IP address are hidden, your online data is encrypted, and your browsing history is invisible to your internet service provider and other third parties. Everybody who cares about their privacy should be using a VPN right now, and NordVPN is the best and fastest VPN provider in the business. NordVPN is software, not hardware, super easy to use, no matter what platform you're on, Windows, Android, iOS, Mac OS, Linux, even your Android TV supports NordVPN. You can connect with just one click or enable auto-connect for zero-click protection. If you're in an area like me, where Astros games are often blacked out and you need to find another way to watch, NordVPN can be helpful. Grab your exclusive Banging the Can NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash the can to get a huge discount on your NordVPN plan plus free threat protection and one additional month for free. This deal is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose except a sense of insecurity. There's a link for this deal in the description of the episode. Thank you to NordVPN for supporting all the can bangers and our online security. And again, that's nordvpn.com slash the can. Now, I am joined by documentarian and director Bradley Jackson. Bradley, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Ross. Happy to be here. Facing Nolan, the documentary about Hall of Fame pitcher Nolan Ryan, premiered earlier this year at South by Southwest here in Austin. I was lucky enough to uh, catch an invite. Much appreciate. And Mr. Bradley Jackson here wrote and directed the documentary. It is the first film that spans the 75-year-old Nolan Ryan's life from his like modest childhood growing up through uh, his days playing for the Mets, Angels, Astros, and the Rangers. Um, how did you decide, you know, facing Nolan, Nolan Ryan, that this was going to be the next documentary you, you really wanted to go after and do? Uh, well, so I feel like, I, like a lot of great projects, it was birthed out of a little bit of professional jealousy. I had just rewatched The Last Dance for the second time. So, you know, I've spent 20 hours of my life watching a Michael Jordan documentary, just seething with jealousy. Like, why couldn't I have made that movie? <laughs> I want to make that movie. Um, and I'm driving from Texas back to Los Angeles. This is during, like, kind of at the in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm just by myself in the car, just thinking, seething with jealousy. And I was like, well, who's my... Who's my Michael Jordan? Like, who's your I'm, equivalent? Yeah. Who's my equivalent of Michael Jordan? Um, and I'm like, well, I'm from Texas. I'm from Houston. And of course, and I love the Astros. Um, and it's got to be Nolan Ryan. Yeah, like, I had to wear I had to wear the throwback Nolan Ryan jersey today. Yeah. And it's like $400 or whatever I've had yeah. in my closet for years. And I figure what better opportunity. Um, yeah. You're a Houston guy. Houston guy. What what high school did you go to? Second Baptist High School. Second Baptist, man, which yeah. is ironically where I grew up uh, going to church and yep. where my mom used to work when that's, I was a kid. That's right. Our mothers actually know each other, which is yeah. how we got introduced. Shout out to Audrey and Debbie. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. And uh, you're living in L.A. now? Yes. How's that? L.A., uh, it's actually pretty cool. 
I'm not I've only lie. been a couple times. Yeah, no, it's uh, East LA. I live East LA, which like is not LA. Like people don't know like about Glendale or Glassell Park or Mount Washington or Eagle Rock, and it's very much like Austin ten years ago. It feels like. Oh, nice. So yeah, it like I don't ever see the Hollywood sign. <laughs> I don't ever walk down, you know, the 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 Walk of Fame or whatever it is. None of the touristy. None shit. of the touristy stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um. So once you decided Nolan was your. Uh, your next thing you were going to go after. How long did it take from the inception of the idea to the screening that I got to see in South by like, how much time was that? How much time passed? Really pretty much from the moment I came up with the idea to the moment we screened it, it was probably 19 to 20 months, which is very fast. That is a lot quicker than I would have imagined. Yeah. I mean, Nolan Ryan threw the fastest fastball of all time. It makes sense that his documentary comes together in record speed. <laughs> um, but no, it just like it all it all clicked. Um, I had the idea. I pitched it to uh, a couple of different people that I've worked with. Um, and they were all just like, Oh yeah, why hasn't anybody thought about this? And I and the answer is a lot of people have thought about it. I think it was it was, you know, timing meets preparation. Right. And we had made a bunch of documentaries up to that point that had achieved certain levels of success. Never like gigantic breakthrough, Giro Dreams of Sushi, Searching for Sugar Man documentary success, but like respectable, like like people knew who we were. And uh, we were able to get into the Ryan family. Uh, I, I created like a big pitch deck of like, this is my vision for the movie. This is how I want to tell it. Um, and the title was Facing Nolan. It was like, what you see on screen is what I was kind of dreaming for the most part. And um, Which is oftentimes not the case. No, no, exactly. And, um, and uh, pretty much um, my producer, Russell Groves, his dad knew Bobby Witt. Okay. Uh, not to be confused with Bobby Witt Jr., his son, who is the phenomenal uh, rookie sensation on the uh, Kansas City Royals right now. Right. Uh, but Bobby Witt Sr. Um, was a really amazing MLB pitcher in the in the t uh, early 90s. So he pitched with Nolan. And my producer's father uh, used to do his plumbing. Okay. And so literally, like, like it's like, well, cool, I'll text Bobby and see if I can get you in with the Ryan family. And then, like, 20 minutes later, I, I'm like, we get a text being like, cool, I forwarded your information to Reese Ryan, who is Nolan's um, middle child. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, my producer's on the phone with Reese, and Reese is like, you know what? This is interesting. We sent him the creative deck. And then, like, I did, we didn't hear anything for a couple weeks, and all of a sudden, I get a, a call from my producer being like, can you be on a plane to Austin next week? We're gonna go to the Round Rock Express Stadium and pitch to the Ryan family, which he Nolan owns the Round Rock Express, yeah, correct? Yeah, Nolan owns uh, a, pretty much every chunk of land from like the Round Rock Express for like five miles. It's, okay, it's good to be Nolan Ryan. Yes, um, and uh, and so we we flew down, we pitched to Reed Ryan, Reese Ryan, and Ruth Ryan before Re you ever got the pitch to Nolan. Yeah, we never we never met we met Nolan after we did the pitch. And I think that was intentional because, you know, and he said this in interviews, his son has said this in interviews, but Nolan didn't want to do it. Yeah. So he's not like when you watch the documentary, you definitely get this impression that he is not um, one of these dudes who's after celebrity and he does not give a shit about pop culture. I've been watching Winning Time right. on HBO, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's funny because when Larry Bird, the guy who's playing Larry Bird, right. portraying Larry Bird on screen, right. uh, comes on, he gives me sort of the same vibes that Nolan Ryan does. He's a dude that was about getting his job done, taking care of his family. He doesn't necessarily no. like all of the attention and the, you know, I mean, that's the reason you haven't seen this done before you right. were able to pull it off. Right. So they obviously trusted you to a degree yeah. and, and your vision. Yeah, I think I think the pitch was good. I think the fact that we had made um, some documentaries that had similar kind of vibes about, you know, people from Texas and also sports related stuff. Right. You did action for I, I believe it was Showtime. For Showtime. A few years back. We talked about that on our show. We did a documentary called Delt, which is about the world's greatest card magician who's also blind. Um, oh, yeah, you it, told me about it's, this. It's, it's the craziest story. And th that guy's from Texas, and it's very Texas-y kind of machismo kind of vibe. Um, and so it was very much uh, like... So essentially, what we were told a couple of months later as we were filming was like, Nolan still didn't want to do it. And then Ruth Ryan, who, if you watch the film, 
is is like she steals the show. She's the she's like the most incredible person in the world. Ruth Ryan more or less said, "Hey Nolan, you're doing this and you're doing it for me because I know how amazing your story is. I lived it. Right. I am a part of it. And your story wouldn't be this amazing without me and your family. And so you're doing this for us. Right. And you're doing it for your grandkids. And so Nolan, I think they uh, Reed likes to say they kind of slow played him. They said like, oh yeah, one interview, maybe two to three hours long, and that's all you have to do. They're going to interview just all the people you pitched against, you played with. And at first that's how it went, but then he kind of liked it. I think he he liked us. Um, I think he liked, I'm from Houston. My producer Russell's from the kind of Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Russell's a big rancher. He owns, his fa- family owns like a ranch and they've owned it for like a hundred years. Um, I went to the same high school that Nolan's grandkids went to all these things we didn't know until we started making it. So I think he started to like enjoy us being around and he's very funny. Like we found out one of his favorite movies is dumb and dumber. No way. No, one of Nolan Ryan's favorite movies is dumb and dumber. Oh, that makes me very, very happy as yeah. it is like a top three comedy for me of all time. Oh, I grew up on that movie. Number you know? one. And a quick, quick side story. So I'm, si- this is a, one of those pinch me moments. I'm sitting in the Astrodome, which looks like a haunted graveyard right yeah, now. Yeah, that's our, for those of you who don't know this, it's the, the stadium that the Astros played in when Bradley and I were growing up. Yes. At one point they had planned to demolish it. It is right next to, uh, Reliant. now what is Reliant. Yeah. And uh, where the Texans play, and they never demolished it, and yeah. it's just kind of this giant rat infested. <laughs> like I don't yeah. even know what's going on. In right, there. exactly. And but we, you can still, if you position, your, and you'll see in the film, you can still position your camera in a way where it looks like you're in the Astrodome. So we interviewed Craig Biggio up there. Right. And so I'm sitting, I'm like hunched down in the corner, talking to Craig Biggio, one of our investors, who's like Nolan, one of Nolan's like dear friends, is there watching, and we're in between setups, and the investor goes, "Hey." What do you think Nolan's favorite movie is? And I'm like, uh, is it Lonesome Dove? (laughs) Is it a John Wayne Western? Tombstone. Tombstone. And he goes, no, it's Dumb and Dumber. And I, I mean, my, I mean, my brain exploded. Like Craig Biggio, who's my other <laughs> sports hero in the Astrodome, and I found out that my other hero that I'm making a movie about, his favorite movie, is my favorite movie, which you never would have guessed if you if you've ever watched an interview with Nolan Ryan yeah. in any capacity, you would you would not guess Dumb and Dumber is his favorite film. Right. Well, I don't. He, I asked him about it. We thought about trying to include it in the movie, but it made no sense. I asked him about it. And he, goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, well, it's not my favorite movie, but. I do think it's really, really funny. <laughs> so I don't think he wanted to admit on camera that it was his favorite movie. Uh, that's fair. Yeah. Anyway, fair. so a Does little bit of, with his reputation. Yeah, a little bit of a sidetrack there. Yeah. Uh, where were we? Where were we? Um, we're talking about Ruth Ryan, actually. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things that obviously, having seen the documentary, mm-hmm. was really kind of surprising to me. I did not know much about Nolan's family, right? Like like you, I grew up with Nolan Ryan as sort of this godlike figure, and I, I was a pitcher as a little kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know... Throwing a fastball was definitely my my it was my best pitch in my arsenal. And anybody who's a fastball pitcher, Nolan Ryan is a god. Yeah. And uh, because he spent time on the Astros and obviously then the Rangers, I I had been seeing him my whole life, but I did not know anything about his mm-hmm. his his personal story. Right. 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 His family. Right. And Ruth Ryan, like you said, she shines through as kind of the almost like the driving force behind his career, I would say. Yeah. I mean, Nolan was obviously very motivated and very disciplined and very talented, but I think that's what really made me realize we had a, a an interesting movie that was going to surprise certain, certain parts of it were going to surprise people when I'm we're pitching the movie to the Ryan family and it's Ruth and Reed and Reese. And Ruth starts talking to me about how Nolan, when he was on the Mets, he would be reading books about banking and cattle on the bus in between games. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? She was like, well, like he thought he was going to maybe play for like five years. And obviously he played for 27 years, which is still, and, which is still mind boggling. Mind boggling. And, and I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, oh yeah, like Nolan didn't, he had no plans to be a lifelong baseball player. It was never in his thought process. I think he just thought like, oh, and and like we talk about it a little bit in the movie, his first contract was for seven thousand dollars, right? Which like that's what you know that's what Carlos Correo makes in one pitch, right. <laughs> and uh, and so pretty much like he he, uh, 
I think, and also, by the way, $7,000 was more than his dad made in a year. So at that point, so it's that not point, like he was looking at it like, this is a very small amount of money. I'm no, getting screwed it was, here. It was genuinely like, oh, $7,000 to go play baseball? This is in- amazing. Right. And so he said yes, and he was drafted thir- um, on the Mets. The Mets draft that year, they drafted 12 other players before they drafted Nolan Ryan. And unfortunately, we had to cut this scene because it takes too long to explain. But we list out. There's this amazing sports writer named Joe Pesnansky. And he wrote this article for The Athletic about how, where he essentially listed the 12 other players who were drafted on the Mets before Nolan Ryan. Right. And he lists out their career. I think 10 of the 12 never made it to the major leagues. One of them played 14 games in the major leagues, and then one of them had an 11-year career. And how many games did Nolan end up playing? In, oh, I don't know how many he played. An insane amount I of mean, games. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's obviously different because the pitcher doesn't play as many games as, as you know, Cal Ripken Jr. For sure. But, I mean, he was on a four-day rotation, too, which is like, if you know anything about baseball, they got rid of four-day rotations and that's one of the years ago, yeah. one of the really shocking things as a baseball fan present day watching the documentary is you get a feel for just how much the sport has changed yeah. since Nolan Ryan started pitching, right? Yeah. When these guys were going I mean, you know, it was it was not a big deal to hear about a pitcher pitching a complete game yeah. back in the day. Whereas now, I mean, they're all about arm rest and trying to preserve these guys for Pitch as long counts. as possible, yeah. which makes everything he did even more freakish yeah. because he was out there throwing nine innings pretty regularly, just getting insanely high pitch counts. And really, oh, yeah. I mean, like we said, the guy's throwing heat. Oh, yeah. he And he gets better as he goes along, too. He's one of those guys that, like, if he's going to have trouble, it might be in the first inning. Right. But if he can get through that first inning and get through unscathed, and, then he's, it's got, on. and he's got one to two of his pitches kind of in the, in the sweet spot, it's, it's on. And one of the things you brought up in the documentary was that there were several, I mean, you interview... All number of people. Craig Biggio, George Brett, Rod Carew, Cal Ripken Jr., Roger Clemens, Tom Grieve, Tom House, Randy Johnson, Pete Rose, Ivan Rodriguez, Bobby Valentine, and then President George W. Bush. But it comes up that a lot of these dudes believed Nolan was touching speeds way higher than they were, like, really able to measure with their radar guns at that point. Yeah. Like, guys were claiming 103, 104. Yeah, that was a moment that was really a pinch-me moment because we're talking to his his catcher from the Mets. So he Nolan won the World Series with the Miracle Mets in 1969, and he was a relief pitcher, which is a surprising fact for a lot of people, too. Like, Very much so. Um, but he, And he really contri- he got a key save uh, both in the World Series and the, uh, the pennant race championship. He was one of the heroes of the series. He kind of. really was. Um, and uh, his catcher, Jerry Grody, uh, who is a Texas uh, local as well, um, was was more or less saying, like, I caught the other pitchers on that team. I caught Tom Seaver, a Hall of Famer. I caught uh, 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 Jerry Kuzman, a, a legendary pitcher as well. And it's like, those guys were throwing fast. But when Nolan threw, I had to adjust how I, adjust, like, how, where I held my glove. I had to adjust how I positioned my legs. Had to give himself a little bit more power in his position yeah, there. And yeah, and he says, and he goes, he was throwing 105, 106, 107, 108. And Which when, is just mind-boggling. <sighs> yeah, and then they, so when they, when they actually did the world-famous speed test on him, which was in 1974, the radar technology hadn't been invented until then, or where they measured the speed of a fastball. Um, they were measuring the ball... 10 feet from release point. And at that point, it was 101 miles per hour or 100.9, which was the fastest anybody had been measured ever. But when you actually measure it from release point, which is how they do it now, right? Um, 108 miles an hour, which is unheard of. Unheard of. I think Aroldis Chapman. Basically Chat- unhittable. Yeah. Aroldis Chapman throws 105 at his like insane prime Fuck uh, that guy. i know right, right. <laughs> i still i still watch the altuve home run every now and then when i can't fall yeah, asleep that, that gets a smile on my face real exactly quick. exactly anyways um yeah so he i mean he just was regularly touching hundreds no problem especially in those angels years yeah that catcher speaking to how uh he had a little bit more pop in his glove when nolan's pitches came in yeah hurt his hand oh my god um yeah that really tells you everything you need to know. So when you went into this and you're doing, I mean, obviously you knew a lot about Nolan, mm-hmm. not so much probably about his his personal life and his right. family. Did you know that Ruth and their story 
Ruth and Nolan's story would kind of become the focal point or one of the focal points, I should say, or did that kind of happen along the way? Was it something you discovered? That definitely surprised me. Um, I mean, I knew we wanted to talk about his family and just because I think that's obviously an interesting aspect of any athlete's career, especially, you know, a, a super famous major league athlete being with the same woman from the age of 16 years old to now 75. Yeah, that, their story's that's, wild. That's amazing in and of itself. Um, but I think just hearing about how Ruth wasn't a, what you might consider traditional baseball wife. Right. She, she was obsessed with baseball, um, and obsessed with sports. She loves competition. She's all, like, they, you know, they talk about how she is actually the most competitive person in that family. Right. Over um, Nolan. Yeah. Over Nolan. She gets, and she would want to, after every single game Nolan pitched, she would want to relitigate the game with him. And he would be, if you know Nolan, he's just like very much like, no, that happened. I'm done. I don't want to think about it anymore. I move forward. Yeah. Yeah. But she was just like, well, like there's, there's a great story about how, um, Nolan should actually technically have eight no hitters. There was one game. So they changed the rules where like an infield error used to be a hit. And now an infield error is an error and doesn't count against the pitcher. Right. But in the early seventies, um, it, it was a hit. So if there's an error in the infield, they would just go, oh, that's a hit. He gave up an infield error to the Yankees. It was like a pop fly, miscommunication between second base and shortstop. Ball drops in the middle. Guy gets to first. This happens in the first inning. And then Nolan throws a no-hitter after that. Damn! And, and so, like, Ruth brings that up to me. And I'm like, oh, so he should have eight no-hitters. And she's like, yes, I've been saying that for years. He should have eight. <laughs> and I'm like... She's, I'm, like, appealing the league. She, I, yeah, honestly, it, it feels like she probably would if she could. Um, but anyways, yeah, that when, I, when, when we started seeing that aspect of the story, um, and Reed Ryan said it best to me as we were kind of halfway through making the movie, he's like, I've always seen this as a love story wrapped in baseball. Um, Which is very much how it plays out when you're, I mean, it's like, it's cool because typically, you know, watching The Last Dance as Mm -hmm. an example, I mean, you're not getting into Michael Jordan's love life or really his personal life at all. It's all about what he did on the court, right? Right. right. Um, Which is cool. It's interesting. And when it's, you know, when it's an all time great in any sport, there's a lot to to talk about still, but you miss the element of like, so what was, what was this dude's life like outside of basketball how did it all how did he keep it together who were the people driving him like what was the story right and that's what i love so much about facing nolan is that you get to know the man right like you walk away from watching it with a feel for like his heart right not just his his pitching prowess right right um who he is as a family man and that that was really really i mean it was impactful thank you yeah and you know um i think very early on in the process his son reed was like, hey, so what's going to be our, like, conflict in this movie? Because my dad didn't have any scandals. He didn't have any, you know, mortal enemies. He didn't have a drug problem. He didn't... Never got arrested. He never got arrested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he the worst thing he did, which was was, was just beat up Robin Ventura, is widely seen as amazing. Yeah. Well, it was amazing. It yeah. was amazing. <laughs> and it wasn't... Nobody can blame him. It serves as one of the, like, the crescendos of <laughs> yeah. the documentary. And I, and, I mean, everybody who knows Nolan Ryan... Knew that was coming at some point, of course, right? The of way course. you played it out was beautiful, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and to me, like the first day on set, I was actually thinking, about, I was like, oh yeah, we don't have a like, we don't have like a he doesn't have a gambling addiction like Michael Jordan, or a, he's not even a jerk to his teammates like Jordan was, um, Just beating the shit out of teammates at practice, <laughs> right? Yeah, he didn't punch <laughs> Steve Kerr in a practice. Um, he and and I was like, well, you know what? This isn't. First of all, like I'm okay with like. I feel like we're in a day and age where like all of our hero athletes have let us down a little bit. And oh, and sure. being from Houston, I mean the Deshaun Watson thing broke my heart. Like yep. I was just like, "Oh my goodness." It was I, brutal, man. We we waited how many years? 15 years to yeah. get a quarterback that could legitimately give us a chance at a Super Bowl and just like that it was gone. It was right? gone. And 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 so I mean, I feel like whether it's Lance Armstrong or Michael Jordan or all these guys where you're like, you idolize them and then you find out they're, they're flawed. They're, yeah. They're flawed and they're human. And not to say that Nolan isn't flawed, but like he doesn't have that like major, like, Oh, good. Ooh, really messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, this is a tall tale in my mind. I wanted to treat this like an actual tall tale. And, 
And somebody who wrote a review for it uh, more or less said, like, if you pitched this as a screenplay without him having been in existence, if Nolan Ryan never existed and you turn in a screenplay and go, I want to write a movie about a guy who's a pitcher. He comes out of nowhere. He breaks every single record. He runs a fully functioning cattle ranch. He stays with his high school sweetheart for 50 plus years. He's got a great family who loves him. And maybe the only thing, bad thing he did was beat up a young guy who deserved it. And you'd be like, dude, get out. That doesn't sound like a good movie. Like right. that, first of all, that's not realistic that's at unrealistic. all. That right. could never happen. And then, but no, it does happen. And I think it's just like, let's just, let's not try and hide the fact that Nolan is a good guy and that he is larger than life, but he's also a, a human being. Right. Um, there's no reason to force controversy where there isn't any. No. Um, I would, no. The real, the only moment I think in the entire documentary where you kind of go, wait, what was that? What? Yeah. Is when that woman uh, sprints onto the field topless or whatever, and he drops <laughs> not topless, not <laughs> topless. Sorry, no, no, yeah, I'll tell you about that. That's funny. Yeah, um, we we got a little bit of uh, 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 someone like a few people have brought that up. Be like, what was that? And it's like so that was an iconic uh, super fan of the Astros. I think I think she was oh. her name was Morgana the Kissing Bandit. I think right, and she would she, that's that was her shtick. She would run onto the field. <laughs> And like kiss a player, and I think like uh, we were interviewing Phil Garner, the legendary Phil Garner, uh, who who used to coach, he's head coach for the Astros when they went to their first um, World Series in in two thousand something or another. Um, and he was like, "Oh yeah, we all had a thing for Morgana. No one was the only one that didn't didn't want to, you know, whatever with her." And, <laughs> and then and then we found the video, and I was just like, "That's a funny. Let's let's throw it's it in there. It's a great moment. It, it is. is a great moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah." Um, especially with the backstory of it being a super fan, that that was what she was like. That was her thing. That yeah, was her shtick. Yeah, yeah. So out of all the people that you ended up getting access to mm -hmm. for this documentary, yeah. what, were most of those people relationships that you that you formed through the Ryan family? Were they like, here? Are, here's the people we still have connections yeah. with. Here are the guys that we think would provide you with good context and, and answers to your questions. Yeah, pretty much everybody that's a player um, in the league we got through the Ryan family, they, they essentially opened up their Rolodex to us and That's said, incredible. here you go. Um, our executive, one of our uh, executive producers is a guy named David Check. Uh, he worked on action. He was the showrunner for, for the action series we did for Showtime. He also used to run Major League Baseball films for 17 years. Well, that's helpful. And he's a great guy. He's awesome. Um, and he, uh, so he had a lot of contacts too. So he could... Sometimes, like, like they couldn't, um, I don't think the Ryan family had, like, a direct contact to Rod Carew, okay. even though they play like, Nolan and Rod played together on the Angels for a year or two, and so, like, Dave would be like, okay, I can find Rod Carew's information, or I can find Randy Johnson's information. So we, we took a little bit of strain off the Ryan family, but for the most part, it was like, I mean, obviously, George W. Bush, we don't get that interview without, you know, Nolan being like, hey, George. You want to talk about me for thirty minutes, <laughs> and you know George being like, "All right, cool." Well, I think I think the amount of um, legendary baseball players and and just people in general that yeah. you that you end up seeing in the documentary speaking about Nolan mm -hmm. says a lot about him too, right? Right. And that just gives you context to how many people this guy was a, a is a legend. Yeah, when you play eyes. for twenty seven years, I think somebody put a, a tweet out recently that said like Nolan Ryan had like a two point six era when the white beatles white album was the number one record in the country and he had a 2.3 era ra when nirvana's nevermind was the top album in the which country. is one of the really things about him that cemented this uh you know legendary status when is it, he got better as he was older like yeah. he really and you you know you, you nail that part of it in the documentary mm -hmm. that that's not a thing that yeah. really happens with pitchers, man. Yeah. Like, you get worn down, your arm gets weaker. Especially when you're a power pitcher. Yes, like, especially. Like a, maybe if you're like a Greg Maddox or, or even a Zach Granke who can kind of like, like you can figure out how to like spin the ball different. I mean, Switch Nolan, up your game. Yeah. Switch up your game. And Nolan definitely switched up his game a little bit. Like, For sure. That was what was really fun to learn when he went to the Rangers is he had this pitching coach named Tom House. And if you look up Tom House... This guy, you, I want to make a documentary about Tom House. He's he is a uh, a legend, um, but he's this behind the scenes legend. He pitched for the Braves for a little bit, I think, and he actually he's pseudo famous as well for catching Mickey Mantle's. He was in the dugout and caught Mickey Mantle's not Mickey Mantle, Hank Aaron's um, uh, 
uh, t- game breaking home run, the 714 or whatever. Oh, back uh, at, he was in the bullpen. He was he in the bullpen it? and he caught it. And he, and there's this great picture where he's like handing it to uh, to Hank Aaron. <laughs> but he's like he's known as like like the the mad scientist of throwing. And he um, a pitcher was whisperer, pretty sorts. much exactly, and or just a throwing whisperer because so he so not even just the pitchers, okay. no it, quarterbacks. He well, actually oh, that's shit. what that's when his career got wild. So he so first of all he was the pitching coach for the Rangers, and he was like the first guy. Look him up, Doctor Tom House. He's amazing. Um, he's got a great Twitter presence. Um, he was the first guy to really be like, hey. There's some science. There's kinesiology. There's science going on in what these guys are doing. So he would like put the little the little computer balls all over Nolan's body and put them in front of a green screen and measure out his throw and be like, okay, your release point needs to come 0.3 seconds early or whatever it is, and your or your shoulder angle needs to be like this instead of like this because your release point's here. And then the, I mean, just and to generate no, as much power and accuracy as possible. Exactly. Yeah. And Nolan, you would think. Being like this old school Texas guy would be like, nope, I'm not changing up my thing. No Go one... fuck yourself, science. It, exactly. Nolan is the exact opposite. Like Tom House calls him a hillbilly genius. He goes, Nolan Ryan is a hillbilly genius in that he is all about finding the most innovative way to become the best that he is. Like p- pitchers were not lifting in the 70s and 80s. Pitchers were not lifting weights, which is crazy. Like, Damn. And Nolan was the only guy who'd be like, when I lift weights, I play better. And he would sneak into the gym. His trainers, I think, for the Angels were like, you can't lift weights. And I'll be like, cool, yeah, I won't. And then he like sneak into the weight room <laughs> and just like get some reps in and then like throw 190 pitches and be fine. Um, so Nolan is very cutting edge uh, when it comes to understanding how technology and science and training can help his body. Um, and then so Dr. Tom House also, um, they changed Randy Johnson's career. Uh, Dr. Tom House changed uh, Tom Brady's career. He changed Drew Brees' career. Uh, if you go into his office in San Diego, he has uh, the cleats that Drew Brees wore for one of his last games in, uh, in the regular season uh, two years ago, and they're Nolan Ryan's bloody lip on the cleats because Drew Brees is like obsessed with Nolan Ryan, and Dr. Tom House like changed his career. It's this cool like That's symmetry an awesome of connection. like. Yeah, essentially, if you're somebody who's trying to throw for a living and you're like late 30s, early 40s, Tom House works with yeah, you. Yeah, he's the guy who keeps you going, gets you sharper, gets you get your game where you need it to be. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, who out of all the people you talked to, was there anybody that was a real surprise in terms of the you know athletes or yeah former presidents? Um, my the biggest surprise to me was Randy Johnson. Um, I think because I thought it was going to be a tough interview, just because I think you think of Randy Johnson as. 6'11", intimidating, bird killing. He's a hard uh, ass. Yeah. And he kind of is, but he also is like, was so giddy to talk about. He was, man, it was really yeah. surprising to and, see how happy a lot of these guys were. Yeah. Not just that they gave you the time. Yeah. They gave you the time and they were stoked yes. to get to speak on Nolan. Yes. And it was almost like they recognized the way that you did and, and, and everybody that helped you put the project together. This had never been done and needed to be done. That this yeah. is a guy whose story needed to be told, and they were stoked to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Randy Johnson, like, the first... I think one of the first questions I asked is, like, just to kind of get people warmed up, like, who is, like, who is Nolan Ryan to the art of pitching? And then, like, Randy Johnson just, like, launches into this soliloquy about how Nolan is, like, um, he's, like, Picasso, or he's, like, Mozart, and how his fastballs are like brush strokes. And I was like, oh my goodness, Randy. <laughs> so deep. So deep. And he just like, I mean, and then Randy, he would say things like, I mean, like there's a line in the movie where he goes, I asked him about like this, the strikeout record that Nolan has. Um, and he goes, oh, his strikeout record? Yeah. Um, I'm number two on the all-time list of strikeouts, and Nolan is number one, and Nolan has a thousand more strikeouts <laughs> than I do. He's and, not close. Is he, his point. Yeah, yeah, he's like, I would have had to have pitched for six more years to have tied Nolan Ryan, and I retired when I was 43. I was going to say, like it's not like Randy retired young. That no. man went deep into his, his for, or early 40s, I think, Yeah, too. I think yeah. he was 42 or 43 when he retired. So it's just like... The reverence these guys have for Nolan is is you know second to none. The so. other interviewee that really stood out to me as like holy shit, this guy loves Nolan Ryan right. was George Brett. 
Yeah. I mean, he provided a lot of spark in yeah. the documentary in terms of he brought his whole A game with the personality and the stories and the Yeah. It was awesome. He's got um, a twinkle in his eye, that guy. Yeah, he does. And he and, and what's interesting is he doesn't actually know Nolan very well. He they just they just faced each other so often. Um is it that, just a respect thing? It's a respect thing, and I think it's an intimidate like I genuinely think George Brett still is a little intimidated by Nolan Ryan. Um, That's and, fair. And like, I, I wish we could have included this in the documentary as well, but like George Brett walked me through p uh, pitch by pitch an at-bat he had against Nolan that he's still mad about. He was more or less he just still like... Still carries it with him. Yeah, he's like, he's like, his base is loaded, top of the ninth, it's two to one, we're losing, I'm up to bat, there's one out, so I think there's no way I'm not at least tying this game. And Nolan gets me in a 2-2 count, and then he throws this like weird change up slider thing that I didn't see coming and I topped it, went to third base, third baseman throws the guy out at home, home plate, throws me out at first, double play, game over. I'm still mad about it. Oof. And I'm just like, dude, you're 65 years old. How are you like <laughs> still remembering this stuff? So as a documentarian mm -hmm. and talking about all these, the people that are interviewed in the doc, one of the things that's always interesting to me, and and you do this a little bit in both of yours that I've watched, in mm -hmm. both Action and Facing Nolan, um, I, I don't think people realize who is asking the question mm -hmm. that is being answered mm -hmm. by the interviewee. Right. And is that always you? On this movie, it was probably 80% me and 20% uh, this guy, David Check, who, is, who used to work for Major League Baseball Films. Um, there were a couple of relationships that Dave had that were like, he knew the guy really, like he knew Rod Carew really well. Oh, okay. And so he's like, he's like, I want to do the Rod Carew one. I was like, great. I don't gotta, I don't have to prepare for it. That's great. Um, and then there was one, there was one trip that, um, I just could not physically go on. I was like, I was out of, I was out of it pretty much. I was out like, of commission. I was out of commission for a, a couple of days. And so, um, so he interviewed Pudge Rodriguez and a couple other guys um, on a trip, and it was—it's great to have somebody like that who can essentially. I mean, he was essentially like the closer, you know. Like if we're doing a pitching metaphor, like I guess for, for the interviews, I'm the starter, and I go eight innings, and you know, or seven innings, and then Dave was the closer, and you know, he shuts him down for the last two innings. But it was great to have somebody because, like, I'm a baseball fan, but this guy was a base is a baseball super fan. Right. Like he can sit down with these guys, these old school guys, and talk to them about the nineteen seventy eight season where there was a strike that happened and you know, you remember when you faced uh this guy and the bottom strong Thurman Munson or whatever, you know, like yeah. and I'm just like, yo, I wasn't even born then. But yeah, he has that knowledge. <laughs> he has that knowledge that, and, and yeah. so that's really helpful to have. Um so yeah. And I guess uh when you're doing the, like, so I, I obviously am interviewing you right now, yeah. right? So I had like a list of questions sure. that we were going to hit on. Yeah. And then there's stuff that comes up mm -hmm. that I end up off the top just asking questions sure. about. Yeah. How much of it is prepared, like here are the points we want to hit versus like when do you know to just let a guy go and tell you their story based on what they want to tell you versus what you thought you wanted them to tell you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would write, I would have a huge list of questions for everybody. Um, and, and it just varies person to person, I assume. Yeah, you know, there are guys, again, like George Brett, who, like, if that guy's cooking, you don't slow him down. Oh, hell no. Um, and then and then there are guys that need you to kind of, like, you know... You gotta keep, draw it out of you them. You gotta draw them out of them. And I think the other thing, too, with a lot of these, with these, you know, older guys who, like, they're, you know, they haven't played in 20 to 30 years, um, you want to give them time. Like, you want to let them... So, like, one of the tricks that I learned is, like, when somebody, especially if it's, like, one of these older guys who's remembering something from 30 years ago, when they stop, t when you think they're done answering their question, give them, like, five more seconds. Because five times out of ten, they're going to go, and then Nolan did this, <laughs> and that's the juice. That's the good stuff. Um, because they're just trying to remember, you know, they, they got to go back into the vault a little bit. Yeah, it's a long ass time ago in the yeah. case of uh, dude who pitched for twenty seven freaking years. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sitting down with W with George with <laughs> former President George W. Bush, yes. was that the the biggest interview you've done in terms of status? Yeah, the biggest interview you've ever done. Oh yeah, hands down. I mean, how much intensity was? I mean, how nervous were you for that? You know, I wasn't. As nervous as I thought I would be because he's always reminded me of my own dad. <laughs> uh, he looks like my dad. He sounds like my dad. Um, and But the weird thing was, and I said this at, at the premiere at South By, 
The second he sat down and we started talking, I couldn't get Will Ferrell out of my head. Because, kept, of his because of his SNL impression. So, like, he kind of did one of those, like, hey, hey, like, laughs, <laughs> like, early on. And I was just like, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to think about Will Ferrell. Uh, but it kind of, like, humanized him a little bit. And George, sure. George W. Bush is like, he's a he's a guy. I mean, obviously, he's not a guy. He's he's the president for eight years. So he's not a guy. But I think that's part of his charm is that, like, he's a guy. Right. He's in, in terms of presidents that uh, can come like are have every man status. Yes. George is certainly one of them in American history that you think of uh, as think of as a guy that you could sit down and have a beer with. Exactly. And talk about Nolan. Ryan, and talk about right? baseball. Exactly. And so, you know, it was definitely one of those like he um, it was cool, too, because he was the only person that we had to send the questions to ahead of time, which, of course, and have them approved, uh, have them approved. And uh, and they even cut a couple out, which which totally made sense. There's like a couple of questions where like it was clear like he didn't know what I was gonna like. He's like, I don't have an answer for this, right? Um, but there was so more than anything, it's him not wasting your time right. with those questions. There was yeah. one moment that I actually I love this moment because we use it in the movie, and I knew I wanted it. I wanted to transition into the Mets somehow, um, and because I wanted to introduce George W. Bush early in the movie, just to be like, "Oh, look, we got W. This is cool." But most people are like, he doesn't really uh, impact Nolan's life until the end of his career at the Rangers. So I was like, how do I get W. in the movie early? in a way that makes sense and doesn't feel forced. And then it hit me like W's like, like his old, like in his family lineage, one of the people, like I think his, his great uncle, like used to co-own the Mets. And so I wrote that down in my questions and his handlers cut it. Cause I think they were just like, well, George W doesn't know anything about the Mets from the sixties. Um, <laughs> and I just added it back in, in my, my head and I, I I asked him I go I go yeah tell me about your family's history with the Mets and he goes I don't I don't know what you're talking about and I go and I was like no 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 like your your uncle used to own the the, the Mets and I was kind of like giving him the eye of like dude I need something here <laughs> and he goes he goes all right let me see if I can help you with this <laughs> he knew what I wanted and he just like so what's funny about my family history is uh, my uncle used to own the Mets, and an, uh, back in the day they had a young flamethrowing pitcher named Nolan Ryan. And I go, and there That's it was exactly what I need, and it's in the movie. It provides that transition piece. And uh, I like to think I directed George W. right there. That's that's an incredible but moment he, for he you in your career. He knew what I wanted, and yeah. he gave it. I was like, "Oh, you're 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 sharp. What a guy. You used to be president." Um, since I was lucky enough to catch the documentary. Mm -hmm. out at South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. It's been acquired by yes. Utopia. Yes. Now, what does that entail? So that entails uh, they're, they're a really cutting-edge distribution company, and they want to they wanna put this movie out in a unique way as widely as possible. And so what they are doing, which I'm so excited about, is they are um, partnering with Fathom Events, and they are putting this out on 800-plus theaters for one night only. May 24th. May 24th. And which makes sense, like, like theaters are old school, Nolan's old school. Um, and I think we want to make this an event because every time Nolan pitched, it was an event. They would talk about, especially with the Angels and the Astros, like when Nolan pitched, they sold 10,000 more tickets every game because uh, you didn't know if he was gonna, what, he, what was he going to do. Yeah. And so, um, so, yeah, they're putting this thing out on 800 plus theaters, May 24th. If you go to fathomevents.com or facingnolan.com, type in your zip code. And there's going to be a theater there for you. And you can find the closest one. You yeah. can find the closest one. And so the hope is that this does really well and we get more like Fathom would do an encore screening, which they I think they're going to do. Hopefully they'll do. And so there will likely be another opportunity for you to see it in theaters maybe two weeks after May 24th. Um, well, I got to say, I, I rarely, you know, I don't think I've ever watched a documentary in theaters before getting to see this one at South by yeah. and it was an awesome experience yeah. I you should add that in part because Nolan was sitting like 12 <laughs> feet from me right um, which was surreal I feel like I spent a lot of time looking at the looking screen at and then looking over at the back of his head like can I get a feel for how he likes this yeah yeah <laughs> you know what I yeah mean? yeah um, but his whole family was there and everything so it was just an incredible experience for me but I could not more highly recommend going to see this thing in theaters, especially if you are a big fan, uh, not just baseball, of uh, I think of sport in general. It is yeah. it is a really 
unique story about a guy who did things that nobody else has done and nobody else will ever do. And that's the part that's crazy. He's one of maybe, you know, 10 dudes in the sports that I follow, basketball, baseball, football, that has records that will never be broken. That there's no chance in hell Mm -hmm. that the game has changed so much since he did his thing that there's not even an opportunity. Like, they wouldn't Mm -hmm. let you try to do what he's done. Yeah. Um, Which just made it all the more cool. Now, another thing I saw through social media Uh is that you got to screen facing Nolan at the Rangers Stadium. Was it after a game? It was after a game. So just up on the big screen... Yeah, it was that was the most surreal experience I think of my entire life um, because uh, one, it was a Sunday day game versus the Atlanta Braves, so it's the the team that won the World Series last year, unfortunately, um, versus the Rangers on a Sunday at you know one thirty in the afternoon. It was the first sellout game that that stadium, Globe Life Field, has ever seen in the se- 16, 17 months they've been open. Forty thousand people were there. Um, they asked me to throw out the first pitch. I did. I almost blacked out. I made it over the plate. I didn't throw a strike. You did it from the rubber. I did it from the rubber. Very important <laughs> note. A lot of people take the easy way out. They walk up five steps in front of the mound or whatever. You yeah. did it from the rubber, and you perfectly executed like the Nolan Ryan arm hang into his motion and everything, man. It was amazing. Well, I wouldn't say perfectly executed. Well, as I, perfectly as I could see you do it. <laughs> yeah. The... Uh, Hopefully, maybe maybe we can. I know there was a videographer there. Uh, I haven't seen the video yet. I don't know if I want to see the video, but <laughs> but that That's was a lot sur- of pressure. That was literally surreal because like we were. It was like I'm walking through the tunnels and I'm like, because normally I've been to games where I've seen the first pitch and like not many people are in the stands. It's like for a lot of baseball games, people don't get to the stadium until like the first or second inning. So it's like if this and, and most baseball games don't sell out. Right. And so it was like. Yeah, it's like there's going to be 20,000 people at the game, but only 10,000 people watch you throw in the first pitch. Well, first of all, 10,000 people is so many people. Yeah. Um, and I'm walking through the bowels of the stadium with the P, uh, with the Rangers PR people, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, so there's probably only going to be like 20,000 people watching me do this. And the guy looks back and goes, try 35,000. And I'm like, what? I've been under in the bowels of the stadium for the last 30 minutes. Like, so you don't have a clue. I have how many no idea. Are out there. They told me it was going to be a big crowd. But I thought most people aren't going to get there until second inning. But it's a Sunday day game. It's one thirty, ah. and the first fifteen thousand people got a Nolan Ryan autographed baseball rubber or whatever a pitching mound. Oh, sick! And so I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I made it over the plate. It was low and outside, but uh, I made it over the plate. You got it there. That's all I that got matters. It there. Really. I did the leg kick. You uh, just want to end up not looking like Fifty Cent. <laughs> or one of the all-time terrible first pitches, right? And there's a lot of them. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is, is not to throw shade at Nolan because he's an iconic guy, but uh, but I, I, afterwards I saw him and, and I shook his hand and I go, I hope I didn't embarrass you. I hope I made you proud. And he goes, well, you couldn't have done it any worse than I did the last time I threw, which if you, if you YouTube him throwing out the first pitch to Craig Biggio like five or six years ago, he kind of let it. He kind of let it say, it. Ah, okay. but also he's seventy years old at the time, <laughs> and I bet his arm has like is like a, a crusty old war veteran, <laughs> just like he can't throw. I mean, just nothing but scar tissue yeah, in that yeah, shoulder at this yeah. point. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, but no, yeah, we got to watch the game up with the the Ryan family. It was a great game. The Rangers won, and then after the movie ended, um, they showed right right sorry right when the game ended. They showed the final inning of Nolan's seventh no hitter on the jumbotron, and then they had a um, they had a Q and A on the field with me, Nolan, Reed Ryan, and then the announcer for the Rangers, Chuck Morgan, and they it was the most and probably fifteen thousand people stuck around. Damn, and. I'm st- I'm I and I didn't know I was doing this Q&A until the day of. I thought it was just going to be Nolan. Not a lot of mental prep time. Which huh? is great, honestly. Made it easier? It made it easier. And so I'm just literally sitting on on st- I'm that we made shirts for the movie like these like facing Nolan shirts uh which I I need to send you on there. Gonna awesome. need one. Gonna need um, one. Um and I wore it just to like promote the movie and I look like a homeless person on stage because like <laughs> no one's in a suit, his son's in a suit, the announcer's looking really good and I'm just like, I feel like 
do I look like a 25 year old person kid who just like wandered just out wander- here? And I'm not 25, by the way. I'm I'm 37. But like, oh, I feel like great. I feel like I looked very young compared, and I'm dressed like a little, uh, like a little college boy. student or little whatever. Baseball fan. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hi, Nolan. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was. And then they showed the movie uh, on the jumbotron. I think like eight or nine thousand people stuck around, and it was amazing. And like when the Robin Ventura fight happens in the movie, like. Everybody just started whooping and hollering, and I was like, this is the coolest experience of my life. Yeah, is- get to see the reaction from that many people in the stadium, and an, obviously a pretty full circle moment from you coming up with the idea to do the Doc on Nolan, to walking through the bowels of the stadium that he walked through, to going out on the mound, you know yeah. what I mean? Or I guess that stadium didn't exist yet. No, no, but, that stadium didn't exist. But, but, but it's, uh, I like the, the concept. Yeah. Yes, the concept of it. No, totally. It, it was definitely one of those, as a filmmaker, um, those are the moments that you dream of um and it, it it didn't disappoint so it was really really cool um and definitely a definitely a bucket list moment so. so it sounds like all in all the project lived up to your expectations yeah i mean we were in that first pitch meeting we told them that we wanted to premiere at south by southwest 2022 and in the back of my mind i go there's no way we can have the movie done that quickly um but yeah, kudos to um, first of all, kudos to the Ryan family for helping us get it there, and then the the unsung hero in any doc, especially a documentary, is the editor, um, and so our editor Eric McMichael is just an absolute wizard, and he just I mean, you couldn't I couldn't have asked for somebody to help sift through that much material and that many interviews and pick the right moments to get the, you know, get the movie to look the way it does and feel the way it does. And so, uh, shout out to Eric. Um, you know, the editors of documentaries are, are, are the unsung heroes. They're like the offensive line, uh, of a, of a, the documentary space. So what is next, uh, for you in terms of, like, have you picked your next project? Yeah. So I, I, right now my, um, another, uh, partner in crime uh, in the documentary space, this guy named Luke Corum. Um, he directed the the action series that we did for Showtime about sports gambling. Cool. He and I are in the midst of making the feature documentary about Millie Vanilli. Millie Vanilli. The Millie Vanilli scandal from the 90s. If you don't know about it, look it up. It's the craziest thing in the world. Uh, it's a, a, I mean... It, I don't know how much you know about it. Ross. I know that like a very limited amount. I, it's like the surface level story, right? I know that Millie Vanilli at some point got in trouble for like misrepresenting themselves as a band. I guess it was yeah, group, yeah. singing group. They lip synced. They were lip synced, um, yeah. but not just in not just live. Their their voices on the record. So they sold over. Let me see here. They sold over a, a ten million records. Their debut album was the biggest debut since I think Elvis Presley. Um, their debut album sold more than Michael Jackson's debut, sold more than Whitney Houston's debut. Um, they had four number one hit singles, Blame It on the Rain, Girl You Know It's True. I mean, iconic, fun 90s pop songs. And then you you learned after about two years of them being the most famous band in the world that they were all they were frauds. But what most people don't know is that there's a man behind the curtain, this evil super producer named Frank Farian, who orchestrated the whole thing and got away, with, got away with it scot-free and he had done this before with another group in the in the 70s and like so it was just it's this wild story of uh of greed and ambition and uh pop music and uh you know uh, smoke and mirrors um and scandal and, yeah. and scandal and and celebrity and so we're yeah we're about we're about a year-ish into making that, and hopefully it'll be out around this time next year somewhere. So you've already been working on that before Facing Nolan even comes out? <sighs> yes, yeah. S- sounds busy. Yeah, it's, and then um, uh, the other fun thing, I'm, I'm writing a screenplay for Imagine Entertainment, um, Ron Howard and Brian Grazer's company, and it's a... I'm familiar, yeah. It's a sports comedy. Uh, it's So imagine, um, remember the 90s sports comedy for kids? Like the Little Big League or yeah, Angels in the Outfield? Or whatever, I'm trying to bring those big back. Big green, big green, um, and I'm trying to bring those back. So I'm writing a script called Airball, and it's essentially like School of Rock meets Moneyball, but for kids. So okay. it's like a super elite STEM school, um, and imagine LeBron, LeBron James's kid is like in middle school, gets sent to that school, 
and the basketball team has to implement this kind of money ball system, okay. like Daryl Morey money ball system to, to like compete. Right. And, uh, and then they start, you know, winning games and all this stuff. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm working on that. I, sh- I probably should be working on that right, right, <laughs> right now, but I'll get you out of here as soon as I yeah, can. Yeah. 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 No, all good. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's weirdly, I'm, I'm, I'm either dabbling with, uh, some nineties nostalgia with Nolan or Millie Vanilli, or I'm in the sports space. So I can't complain. Those are all, fun spaces to live absolutely i've often said that this is this is you know the last 20 years Mm -hmm. have been this new golden age of television where i mean we're at the point right now where there are so many must watch shows that i'm just like i don't even know i'm going to be working on getting through this list for the next 40 freaking years i know um and then obviously in the in the last i would argue five years 10 Mm -hmm. years even Mm -hmm. We've sort of hit like the what I've seen as more of a golden age of documentaries as well. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. that's good timing for you. Great timing, um, and I, I yeah, I really think I mean I think Netflix had a big thing to do with it. There's a series called Chef's Table that I think was the first r- true doc series as we know it, and I feel like without Chef's Table, I don't think we have. This All golden these age. different stories. Yeah, because I think people are like, oh, people are down to watch these documentary stories told over eight hours, six hours, or whatever. And they can be one-offs, little one-offs here and there, or they can be, you know, I, f- I feel like it was Chef's Table, and you remember the, uh, I think it was the Jinx yeah, dude. on HBO. Those two, like, both hit, I feel like, kind of in the same timeline, and people are like, oh. And the plus, you can make documentaries for so much cheaper. Right. Like, like if you're going to make six hours of content for HBO and it's scripted, that's going to be a hundred million dollars. Right. If you're going to make six hours unscripted for HBO, it's going to be like $5 million. And sometimes they get the same ratings. And sometimes the story is better told through a documentary than it is through like a fiction added, you know, exactly. I mean, it's what makes winning time really impressive to me is I'm like, I can't believe I love this. Like the fact that it's as good as it is and is as entertaining as it is, even though it's really pissing off Jerry West, is crazy to me because like on paper, that story, I knew a lot of it. So me watching it play out on screen shouldn't be as fun as it is, but it is. Um, but yeah, to your point, it's it's interesting to me that some stories are more fitting for a documentary than they are for like fictionalizing it and trying to turn it into some dramedy thing. Have you seen, I haven't watched it yet, but have you seen the Magic Johnson documentary? No, I'm not watching that shit. Okay, why not? I'm just curious. I haven't watched it. I mean, it because they that documentary to me is just Magic and his camp trying to provide some counter to Winning Time and what is more of like a salacious story, right? And right. I get that they want to preserve uh, Magic's reputation as much as they can, but as it's been explained to me, the documentary on Apple TV Plus is just the Lakers skipping to the championship every year and in between Magic loves his wife. And that's not really the real story <laughs> comparative okay. to what people are aware of, right? Okay. So it's I haven't just... watched either. I've watched the pilot for Winning Time and I loved it, but like again, I just I just had a child and uh, so congratulations I, uh, th- by the way on the thank newborn. You so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, but but yeah, so I haven't I want to watch I want to watch both. Like I I love you know, I love Magic Johnson. I yeah, love don't Adam get me wrong. McKay. It's... It's um, likely I watch it at some point just sure. to see the footage of Magic in his heyday and his prime because that's not something I've gotten to enjoy as much as people who are older than us, 10, right. 15 years older than you and right, I. Right, right, exactly. Um, but yeah, there's there's just an incredible amount of of great stories to yeah. consume right now. Yeah. And it, it makes me very happy as yeah. somebody who's what's, obsessed what's, with consuming. What's crazy too is have you heard about The Staircase? I just saw like the trailer. Yeah, that was based on the... Probably, actually, if you want to go back to the original docu series, the Staircase docu series, which if you haven't seen I watched that, it, it's awesome. It is, but that that's a they, they were making that for years back in like the '90s and 2000s because that story is so old, right? And it's it's so befitting that 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 actually might have been the original first docu series, true crime docu series, and now it's being turned into a big prestige TV. Uh, Colin Firth HBO kind of a thing entertainment so, deal. Yeah, yeah, I know. I love it. It's uh, it's great. It's a great time to be a filmmaker. It's a, it's really hard, obviously, because I think, you know, the I went and saw uh, my wife and I went and saw everything everywhere all at once. Haven't seen it yet. Really want to. Unbelievable. It's so good, and I'm so glad it's be getting successful because I'm like that. That's the kind of movie that I feel like we're missing. Like the the really bold original vision. But it also, it involves like the multiverse somehow. Yeah. Um, so it's like, 
the one area I wish would 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 level out a little bit more in the film space is like the big theatrical movies. I wish they weren't all. I love a Marvel movie. I'll see I'll see them. I'll see Doctor Strange. I love Spider Man. But like, I wish we had more. Everything everywhere all at once is for sure, and I um, think there will be a balance at some point. That's yeah. a, a balance that gets struck. That's yeah. a little more to uh, to your to your liking because yeah. we just went way too far in that direction where it was like everything was Marvel for five years. I know, I know. Um, but there has been more and more. And I, just to throw out another show that currently is I just finished it and it's still blowing my mind. Yeah, Severance on Apple TV Plus. Oh yeah, we finished that. The other oh day my too. God! Like so to to speak of originality, like I just never seen that angle taken before. I've never seen anybody do anything like that. Yeah. And then to have the director be Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller, which if you didn't surprise me as much, had did you see his Showtime series? No, Escape from Danamora. See, I no, I didn't know he had. You this probably in don't it. even know what Escape. Nobody nobody watched it, but it was like Ben Stiller directed every episode. Uh, Paul Dano, Benicio del Toro, Patricia Arquette. What the fuck? It's awesome. It's on Showtime. Escape from Dana Mora, okay. and it's a seven-episode mini-series about this true prison escape um, from the two uh, thousands, I think. And Patricia Arquette is incredible in it, just as she is in Severance. <laughs> but she's so different. Like, I, my wife and I were watching Severance, and I'm like. I am so scared of her. Oh, she's terrifying. She's terrifying. And she's also terrifying in Escape from Danamora, but she's a real person and she's like w different. And so I'm like, are we in the Patricia Arquetaissance right yeah. now? <laughs> I think we of. are. In the, we need to start, We had the McConaissance and now we're in the Arquetaissance. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be the David Arquetaissance because he was great in Scream. Absolutely. He's great. The new Scream, he's great in. Talented family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bradley, thank you so much for taking the time today. Where can we follow you on social media to keep up with your projects and the releases? Yeah, you can. I'm on Twitter at Bradley Jackson, I think. It's easy to remember. Okay. Uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> I actually don't know what my Twitter is. I'll, I'll double check you right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then I'm on Instagram at Bradley H. Jackson. Um, at Bradley Jackson on Twitter is yeah, correct. Yeah. And then at Bradley H. Jackson on Instagram. And then, yeah, Facing Nolan, we have a Twitter page, we have an Instagram page. If you literally go to FacingNolan.com right now, it takes you to where you can buy tickets to see or the movie. Or the May 24th screening. May 24th at 7 o'clock, all over the... It's every showtime is at 7. Um, so whether you live in Montana, whether you live in Houston, Texas, whether you live in New York, you will find a theater within 10 miles of you that you can see this movie at. Uh, and it would be... It would really like help the film get it to a wider audience because we are we are hopefully going to get this on streaming one of these days. But um, obviously, if it does really well in theaters, that helps our case. So that's a separate. It's a whole separate. I mean, we could get world in the, entirely. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hope is too we get to show it at some more stadiums. Like that would be sick. Um, we'd love to show it. Like there's some talks of showing it at the uh, uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, in Cooperstown. Um, so you know. I think there's a really fun life life cycle for this movie, um, but I th it, a lot of people are hoping if it does really well on May 24th, I think that helps our case. Bradley, thank you again. Of course. Everybody go to FacingNolan.com right now. Grab yourself tickets to the May 24th showing that is closest to you, yeah. and enjoy. We'll talk again soon, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Mr. Bradley Jackson. We greatly appreciate him taking the time to answer all my questions and for getting me into the South by Southwest screening. Make sure you tell your Houston sports friends and family about Facing Nolan and grab tickets to see Facing Nolan on May 24th by going to FacingNolan.com. It'll show you the theater closest to you. They're all over the country, so no matter if you're in Houston or displaced somewhere else like I am, you can catch this show at Facing Nolan on Twitter and Instagram for up Updates. And also make sure you tell your Houston sports friends and family about banging the can. Make them some can bangers. Support our sponsor, NordVPN. Again, that's NordVPN, N O R D V P N dot com slash the can, code the can to get a huge discount on your NordVPN plan plus free threat protection plus one additional month for free. Follow us on social media at banging the can on TikTok, at banging the can on Instagram, at banging the can on Twitter. Hit bowlinmedia.com slash shop to grab a Banging the Can dad cap or t-shirt so you can represent around the city of H-Town. I am Ross Bolin. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at W-R-B-O-L-E-N. W-R Bolin. William Ross Bolin. First name William, go by Ross. It's not confusing. W-R Bolin, Twitter and Instagram. I will be back soon. Until then, H-Town, stay down.